Uh, let me also say good morning to all the other participants in this workshop. Uh, and I'm very happy as a civil society actor that I'm coming at the last position after all the presentation from the experts. It was very, very enriching and also a learning process for me. So in short, I'm going to do my presentation again as somebody working for civil society, having just a broad view from all the perspectives that we've learned from the communities with which we work, and also our own observations in the field. Uh, just to quickly set the stage, uh, let me just talk about uh, our organization, which is the Network for the Fight Against Hunger. Uh, it has been created since 2001. And however, the key programs within our organization is LAM and food justice, and also extractive industries. When I talk about land and food justice, I'm talking essentially about food security. That is our interest. And with respect to the extractive industries, we are very much interested in oil, gas, and mining projects. Not only the projects, and also the revenue part of it. And you understand why this workshop is very important for us, because besides what we are doing, I think the blue world is also entering into our radar in terms of deepening the work that we do. And our mission as an organization is essentially to combat the systemic problems causing hunger and poverty. Next. Now, for the sake of this pre presentation, I'm just going to share our own experience. I know a lot have been said with respect to this topic, but I've chosen particularly pressure in the maritime and coastal area of the town of Kribi. And I'll also be interested to look at the impact of this pressure on the local community livelihoods for essentially fishermen. Next. Now, before I continue, I want to make just two quick observations. As we have all seen from different presentations, infrastructure development, oil exploration, oil exploitation, even gas exploitation and also transportation projects in the coast of Kribi are treated as generating revenue for the state. And which is very true. All these projects, they do generate revenue. But we have to note that their execution is also exerting a lot of pressure on marine life and therefore generate some negative and social impacts on the neighboring communities. Uh, and I think one thing that I'm going to add with this presentation is the focus on the, the situation of neighboring communities. Next. Now, after that observation, this is one project that is going, I'm going to focus on very much. This is about the Chad Cameroon oil pipeline. We know that this is a very uh, big project where oil exploited in the southern region of Chad is transported through the pipeline right to the coastal area of Kribi, and then proceeds to the offloading terminal, which is uh, within, within the sea. So this project is going to be particularly interesting to me because as an organization and also as an individual, we have worked a lot around this project. Next. And then just to remind ourselves again about some of the sources of pressure in the creepy coastal marine environment. I know all this has been mentioned already. We are talking about the oil installations that are existing within that zone at the Ebome floating uh, terminal. Uh, this is where the oil from through the Chad Canon pipeline ends. And then offloading or loading vessels come to take the oil, you know, to transport to the international market. And one of the pressure is also exerted by the oil transport uh, pipeline. As I said, at the coast, the oil transport pipeline extends some few kilometers into the sea where the offloading vessel is. And then others have already mentioned the offshore oil exploration and even gas exploration and exploitation uh, projects within Kribi. And above all, also the port infrastructure. So these are a combination of sources of pressure in creepy coastal and marine environments. Next. 
Now, these are some of the emerging issues that I would like to highlight. I know Nana has uh, also mentioned uh, some of them uh, in his presentation. Uh, the first one is the destruction of marine habitats. I'm talking about the natural reef. And this is this large rock where the fish used to harbor. And after the destruction of that reef, the testimonies we had from the fishermen was to say there is the disappearance of some of the fish species that they depended upon. These are some of the names, but unfortunately, I didn't write them in English. But this is what they told us. I just wrote the names as they are. So because of the dis uh, destruction of this marine habitat, which is a natural reef, you see, it has an impact on the livelihood of the people who depended on fishing for their subsistence. I know, however, that uh, the company that did the destruction of this, uh, this, uh, this natural reef replaced that with an artificial reef. And still, based on testimonies from the fishermen, they say even with that replacement, it has not brought back the fish to the sea that were previously uh, existing. So this is one issue that has emerged from this destruction of the natural reef that was existing there. Uh, and I know people have also mentioned uh, the oil spills and the marine pollution in Kribi. And one thing I can highlight there is just that during the first oil spill in January 2007, actually the next day fishermen, because it happened at night, the next morning fishermen were already aware that they saw something on the sea. But communication from the company and also the government came very late, maybe like three days after. But the fishermen who are active in the sea were already aware of all this that happened. And then another oil spill that happened in 2010, which we also monitored. And, and I think it is true what maybe Joel read from the things that we wrote about this oil spill that he got to know about our organization so as to invite us to participate in this, uh, in this exchange. So these are just some of the emerging issues that I can highlight. Next. Now, I mentioned initially about the livelihood of the neighboring communities. And here I'm talking about the, the fishermen who are dependent on fish for their livelihood. And we know that for a very long time, there has always been dependence on artisanal fishing for generations. And most of them, they use the local boats and also the fishing nets. Uh, we heard that clearly from, uh, from Nana. Uh, however, because of the projects that were built, and the fact that I mentioned one emerging issue, which was the destruction of the natural reef, and with the absence of fish, around that natural reef, the fishermen now, with all the local boats, it has an impact on them. Because to have an appropriate catch, you have to go further into the sea. But with local boats and just simply the fishing nets that they have, you see, it poses a problem. Therefore, that is why they have to maybe have engine boats that can take them a bit longer. So this is one situation. Uh, and I, all, I was also talking about the floating terminal, the oil floating terminal, which is situated from the coast, some kilometers from the coast. And for security reasons, the fishermen told us about, you know, security restrictions because they prevent them from going near to the floating uh, vessel, you know, to increase their, their catch. And also some of them complain about the destruction of their needs, you know, by the various marine installations that are found uh, in the sea. Next. Now, because of a combination of all these factors that I've mentioned, there is bound to be some emerging conflicts. First of all, between the, the, the local communities and also the companies. When I talk about local communities here, I'm talking particularly about the, the artisanal fishermen for the various reasons that, that, that I mentioned. And as an organization, we try to see how this can be handled 
because after the destruction of the natural reef and the problems that ensued and the complaints from the fishermen, the company did not recognize its obligation to accord any compensation with respect to that. So as a civil society organization, we lodged a complaint. This complaint was lodged to the World Bank because if you remember, the World Bank participated in financing this project and they have a complaint mechanism whereby communities that are impacted by their projects can lodge their complaints. So we lodge a complaint to the um, compliance advisor ombudsman of the World Bank. And the essence was to bring the company and the fishermen to have a discussion, to see how the problems they are facing as a result of the destruction of the natural reef and the fact that they don't have enough fish catch, you know, how that can be compensated. And I would admit that this is a process which is always long and very cumbersome. We started around 2011 to 2019 or 2018, it was still pending with regular meetings between the companies, and the fishermen trying to look for ways and means, you know, to, to see into the problems created by this, uh, this project within the sea. So that was just an aside to say again, speaking from the perspective of the civil society organization, all what I've heard here today is very, very important to me because since we're interested in the food security of communities, I think marine food security is also very important. Again, as I said, this is also one area that I want to extend our radar. And I think uh, all the information I got from here will be very important for us to, to build and think for any work we do on food security. So that is what one consequence when there's this pressure in the coastal area, which affects the local communities. Next. Now, I think I would like to end there, but raising instead concerns in my conclusion. And the fundamental question is have fishermen improved upon their lives compared to what obtained before? And however, what is also important, and I think this is the essence of this exercise, and maybe the next uh, workshop that we are going to have, is how can we balance these large coastal projects without generating revenue for the state? How can we balance that with the welfare of the communities that are essentially dependent on marine life? So this is one question that, uh, that is like food for, for, for thought for us again. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share these uh, these our perspectives with respect to the pressure, you know, within the coastal areas of Cameroon.